Hey guys, here's the question I want to start with. I want to know what made you come to this session. So if you pick this session because you're interested in the government application, is there anybody who is interested in government? If you're interested just that you think space is cool, <laughs> there we go. Any other reasons why people came along? Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Anybody else? Reasons why you picked this session other than space is cool or you're interested in government uses of web and social media? All right. So um, my name is Ali Llewellyn. Um, and this is my boss, Nick Skitland. He's really a main boss. He can't talk today, so he's drawing instead. Um, and we can make requests of what he needs to draw. I'll just start by saying this. I have the coolest job in the world. I, and I mean that really seriously. I have the coolest job in the world. I get to get people not just excited about space exploration, I get to get them involved. Um, we work for the Open Government Initiative. If you're interested in more about what open government is, we'll talk about it through the course of the presentation. But really, fundamentally, what motivates us on our team is to say that space exploration needs you to come and participate in it. It's not something NASA does. It's not something astronauts and rocket scientists do. It's something that we all do and that we all have a role in. So um, feel free to follow either one of us. And um, as we go through, we'll talk to you more about what makes us excited. So um, the key to space is the human experience. Um, did you ever see something that was cool about exploration that made you excited about it? Like, what makes you think space is cool? Throw me out some examples. Something you saw or something you've seen on space? No, like, gravity. no gravity. Absolutely. What else? Velcro. Velcro. <laughs> the adventure. Like, that's the thing. Like, it's, it's so interesting. People come and talk to NASA and say, you need to learn to tell your story because things we tell is tragedy stories. And NASA is the first to own up that we have our, more than our share of tragedy stories. You know? But they also have this miraculous adventure hero side to the story. And we have to be sure that we tell both. What else is compelling about the human experience of space? The infinite possibilities. The unknown. The unknown. Things we want to go and check out and learn about. A couple more. You can't just go there. It's not immediately accessible to everyone. We're working on that. <laughs> what, one more, and we'll go on. Mars. Mars. <laughs> exactly. So the thing that's exciting here, guys, is we have the best story in the world to tell. And so figuring out how you take that story and tell it to the public. Um, social media has been a great example of how to draw people into that experience. We just said space isn't accessible to everyone. And our goal is to find ways to actually do that and make it accessible. So here, so I'm going to start with some great examples. Um, this is the Mars Phoenix lander. Who's heard of Mars Phoenix? Um, this was one of NASA's first forays into real use of social media. Um, this account was very anthropomorphized. So it was one of the first ones that reached out as if speaking for Mars Phoenix. So as you see, take care of that beautiful marble out there in space. I'll be keeping an eye on here. Unfortunately, um, Phoenix is dead now. Um, may she rest in peace. Um, but it was a great example of a really successful um, outreach. LCROSS um, and LLO, these are two more examples of moon missions. Um, that have been really successful in both making science missions that the average, the average American isn't that interested in science, A, which is a really sad commentary, isn't it? And two, those that are interested don't always know how to connect with it. So LCROSS and LRO, both of these missions said, let me explain some of what's happening here that people could feel connected. Love it. See Mars up there talking back, sharing the human experience. I know, right? Sometimes it's good that you can just give us pictures. <laughs> All right, so what's so cool? You guys are very aware of this. Social media lets us tell our stories in new ways. It takes what seems far away and makes it feel close to, close to us. It makes it feel like it connects to part of our lives and part of our experiences in ways that are really important. Um, so I'll start. This is one of our first astronaut to embrace the use of Twitter, Mike Massimino. He's the really tall, big guy on the left. 
Um, he's been an amazing advocate for NASA to engage socially with people. So you see here, he sent the first Twitter from orbit um, and talking about launch, what he was doing there. And then you can see one of his Twitter responses when he um, landed back, back on Earth. So feel free to interrupt me. We'll take questions. Astro Mike. Um, interestingly enough, Astro Mike now has 1.2 million followers. He does. Oh, is he? That's kind of sketchy. Um, Mike, no, nah, just kidding. Mike Fossum, who's now on the International Space Station, is Astro Aggie, and he's also um, very fervently an Aggie. But this has been a great example because Mike has been one of the ones who took his experience on orbit and shared it with the American people in a way that they felt like they could share it with him, like that it mattered to them. Um, there are 25 active astronauts um, currently using Twitter. You can go to the account NASA underscore astronauts, and it's a group list. They um, copy all the astronauts on Twitter, um, plus one robot astronaut, Robonaut 2, currently on the International Space Station, um, tweets frequently. Um, it was some great stories. Recently, he was unpacked for the first time on orbit, and um, he tweeted about that experience, what it was like being left in a box until they finally let him out. <laughs> um, as we just said, two astronauts currently on orbit um, using Twitter, Astro Aggie, which is Mike Fossum, and Astro Satoshi um, Furukawa, who is um, the Japanese crew member. We're about to send up another mission. Um, we have three crew members on orbit right now, and three more are going soon. Any questions before we go on? Okay. Uh, this is TJ Creamer. Um, you had some notes about TJ, didn't you? Okay. That one. Sure. So, so TJ is really interesting because he's actually the first astronaut to live tweet from space. So back in the day, back when Twitter was young, way back in the day, we were actually tweeting from space, but the way we do it is the same way we'd communicate normally where we'd, se we'd send packets of information up and down. And so the astronaut would say, please add this to my Twitter account. And they'd send a package of information down and then somebody in PAO in Mission Control would up upload it to Twitter, which is, it's all right, it's pretty cool, but it's not really tweeting from space. So TJ is actually the first person who tweeted from space and he's the guy who connected the internet or hooked up the internet on space station. So they're actually able to, you know, search Google and tweet and check their Facebook status and everything is pretty cool. I'll make a side note that um, Doug Wheelock recently did the first Foursquare check-in from space. <laughs> and so that was also another interesting angle. So it's been exciting to see NASA grow in its acceptance of going, well, most of our agency doesn't know what Foursquare is. But by choosing to engage and participate in that forum, they're opening the realm of space travel and space exploration to a whole audience that knows all about Foursquare and not that much about space. And so it's really fun to see where the intersections come together and what begins to happen. Um, TJ also began um, a series of live question and answer sessions where people frequently, pe their Twitter followers would um, send notes up and questions and they would respond back to them. So as, as you guys are very aware, I'm sure, part of the vital way of building that online presence is that social media is a conversation. And that was something that we're still working across our agency to remind people. A traditional public affairs view of communication was very unidirectional. We decide what the right information is and we broadcast it out. Well, that model does not work online. So to engage people in a bi-directional conversation, to deal with different sources of information, different experiences. Um, we talk great about NASA has great tragic, I mean terrible tragic stories. You know, you have people coming who will discuss those things online. Some people are in pain about it, some people grieve, some people don't understand. It's, it's a whole different beast of figuring out how do you manage a community around these really complicated issues. Um, Astro Suichi, um, this is Suichi up here. He was the first to tweet down, pick, use TwitPic from space, and he'd tweet down these images as a challenge of where in the world is this? And so it became a game that other crew members have continued on orbit. How do you decide where this location is? And 
teachers would use it to teach geography and get kids excited about different perspectives on the planet. Um, another really famous twit pic from Suichi. Um, here's a great one, I really love this one, um, because the astronaut told the story about he could use the internet um, to send flowers to his wife from orbit. I mean, it's just, it's, it makes it so much more personable. People who don't realize what the story is of what happens on the station, what an astronaut's life is really like, how they maintain their home life, it's been a great tool um, to bring space exploration close to people. Astro Ron is another great story. Ron Guerin um, just landed um, from the International Space Station recently. Um, this is actually for Google Plus. It's interesting. Um, we're starting to explore how to shape NASA's presence on Google Plus. Um, the found the lead um, project lead for the platform tweeted out, "Do we have any astronauts on Google Plus?" And somebody came back and said, "Ron Guerin is one of them. Uh, is the only one." And um, he had 100,000 new followers that same day. And so it's so, it's so interesting because people said, I can do a hangout with you. I can ask you. I can come near to you. Um, the opportunity, whether on Twitter or in a Google Hangout or, or all these different mediums where you can put someone in the presence of people who might not ordinarily get to connect with them is really exciting. Um, social media lets us connect with people from around the world. Here's some of the things that people have said back to us. So this is part of the um, multi-directional communication. Um, we don't want just as NASA to be telling other people what we want them to know. We want to be hearing their feedback. Um, and so it's really cool for us to go, what do people think about what we're saying? What do people think about what we're doing? We get a lot of people who um, say, thanks for inspiring my kids. People who say, we like to read, keep, keep telling us what's going on. People who say, I have a secret dream to work for NASA. People who say, it comes alive for me in a great way. Um, because here's the key, observation is participation. Observation is participation. So um, we work in an agency that has kind of a particular view on what they call education outreach. You know, we want to outreach to the community, and that normally comes out as, let's go to a school and write some curriculum about math and science, which is an awesome thing. But we're trying to help expand the idea that to reach into the community is to give people not just a realistic view on what we're doing in our program, but give them ways that they can get involved, ways that they can share feedback, ways that they can share their expertise in a substantial way, um, in, a, in a way that will make America's space exploration more valuable. It's less broadcasting and more listening. Wouldn't we all do better with that? Um, but here's the key, right? We have to go where the conversations are. We can't wait and bring the conversations to us. We have to go to the places where they're happening. And they're not always happening in our companies or in our agencies. Frequently, what we have to do is, is go out, talk to people where they are, and find out what they're thinking. Um, this is a great example of that. Um, one of the really successful NASA efforts has been in tweet-ups. Um, this is one of the one of the next ones that's going to happen. A tweet up. I'll be, who's heard of a NASA tweet up? Anybody? Interesting. So a NASA tweet up is um, an effort where they will host 50 to 100 of NASA's Twitter followers. It's a random drawing. They have open invitations. You can put in your application. They'll draw 50, and you can come to a launch um, or a special event. And they have some speakers and talk, they invite them into the Space Center for the day, answer questions. And then what do you think those um, tweets do back for them? Hello? They talk about it, right? They talk about it. So when I bring 50 people in to watch the last launch of the Space Shuttle, they made that the number one trending topic on Twitter that week. Now, we all think space is cool, but do you think it's that publicly cool that that would happen? It's not high in the national consciousness. And so tweet ups have been an amazing tool to say, we're gonna figure out who our fans are, right? Because they're already following us. 
They're already listening to what we have to say. We're going to invite them in, give them special access, which honestly for NASA, it's not a cheap event, but is it that expensive? We have the stuff already. We're just inviting them to come in and do it. And then they're going to go out and advocate for us. This is part of how NASA's learned we're not just talking to people, we're making advocates members of the public who are going to reach out and advocate for NASA on their own time and their own energy. It's been a, an amazing thing to see um, what they do and how excited they get. This was one of the last tweet up groups out by the clock at the launch and you just see how their feelings are about it. It was an honor and a privilege to be there. And so NASA has done an amazing job of learning how to take advantage of that part of people's hearts that says, oh, that's really cool. Give them a little special access, which is relatively low hanging fruit budget wise and effort wise, and then getting tons of response back from it. Um, you can see this. Um, the next tweet up is going to be November 23rd and 25th uh, in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center um, for the launch of the Mars rover. So who was Mars? You were Mars? Somebody's like, Mars. Um, so you can go there, enter your Twitter name, and apply. I've actually, I recently entered for um, the next actual tweet up is going to be in, um, a in Mountain View, California, um, the Sophia Telescope. They have a giant telescope in a 787 that flies at really high altitude and does infrared astronomy. And so they're going to draw 50 twi Twitter followers and say, come go on the plane with us. So think about, I mean, in whatever kind of work you do or environment you're in, what do you have that you could invite people into? And then they go out as ambassadors for your company or your agency um, or your organization. But yeah, go, go sign up, see if you get it. We've come a long way. Do you want to add anything as we go on? It's, no, it's a NASA.gov NASA slash, slash tweet, up. tweet up. <clears throat> So the slide that we've came a long way, <laughs> she's, she's telling me not to tell you. <laughs> it's, so it's a random drawing, so it's... We're going to post them on SlideShare, so you can go. <laughs> and if you guys ever want to come check out Johnson Space Center, I mean, that's where we work. So we'd be happy to show you around. Look us up on Twitter and let us know you're in town, and we'll show you around. And we'll give you your own tweet up. But, you know, NASA's came he a long way. He means that. So he's not yeah, just saying that because we're in public. Like, really, just tweet one of us and we'll totally okay. come and hook you up. So, so NASA's came a long way. You know, back when, back about four years ago, NASA was pretty scared of social media altogether. And now we're seeing, at least in government, as one of the leaders in social media. And I think we've done a lot of really creative things with it, like robots twittering from Mars and astronauts twittering from space and tweet ups. I think there's some really cool innovations and, and we still get a lot of just kind of the skepticism inside NASA. People being saying, saying like this, there's no real value to social media and we couldn't disagree more. And I think over the past four years, we've actually seen quite a bit of value. And so what we're talking about now though, is just really moving beyond social media. Like, I mean, social media is nice in terms of communicating your message, but how can you actually use social media to engage other people who don't work for your company or your, your organization in your actual mission? And so one of the things we often say is that NASA can't actually live up to its fullest potential unless it engages its citizens around the world. Because if you think about all the people who are passionate about NASA and would love to just volunteer their time or expertise or resources to help us accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, we could get a lot more done. So it's pretty exciting. Absolutely. And I'll just, I'll pause here and share kind of part of my personal perspective is um, when you start looking at social media, NASA was not the earliest to adopt Twitter or Facebook or any of these other tools. Like most government agencies, they looked a little skeptically on these trends, right? Um, another example is a website Nick started. It was called OpenNASA.com. And it was an ongoing blog about um, real life at NASA and the real issues that face it. Well, now NASA's really adopted all those things. Um, they've ta Twitter became t went from being something that was um, out there on the edge that people weren't sure what they thought. And, and the team made it awesome and they brought it in. Open NASA went from being out there and they brought it in. So it's really exciting to me to stand in a position to um, 
bring things in and incorporate them in an agency um, that starts off with a lot of skepticism and that starts off with not being sure that this can, can change anything or make it better. Um, so like Nick was saying, the key about social media is really social. The key is the interaction and the conversation. It's less about the media, it's more about the social. It's about the fact that we really need that expertise that's outside of our company, outside of our, of our agency. We need not just, it's, it's great when you talk to astronauts about how they build astronaut classes. Um, originally when they started building classes of astronauts, they all were one background. Anybody know what kind of background they had? They were all fighter pilots. Well, now when they build astronaut classes, anybody know what kind of background they have? We tend to have a scientist, an engineer, an educator, a doctor, and which do you think is stronger? The diversity of backgrounds creates a collaboration that's much more valuable, a conversation that's broader and more diverse um, and makes a, a way better product. Um, so like we said, the best... Hey, one thing really quick. Since you brought up the astronaut thing, if you guys are interested in becoming an astronaut, <laughs> which I think there has to be somebody... In November 2011. Yeah, they're opening up the astronaut applications right now, and they're going to be choosing astronauts next spring and for a start date in June. So, you know, if you're looking like for a career change or you're going through a midlife crisis, <laughs> now is a good time to apply to be an astronaut. Um, if you go to ask, I think it's astronaut.nasa.gov. Plural. It has can, an S. Is it is astronauts? S? Okay, I spelled that wrong. Sorry. Um, so check it out. <laughs> Do you have to be an American citizen to be a NASA astronaut? Yeah, but there are other agencies that haven't. So all you need, you need a um, degree in math, science, or engineering, and three years of experience professionally. So NASA only takes U.S. citizens, but there are lots of other agencies that. Or for two hundred thousand dollars, you could buy a flight on Virgin Galactic. So one of the cool things about space True. exploration right now is that it's really opening up to commercial space flight, and so Virgin um, is probably going to start flying people next um, year. So I heard, um, and I think there's four hundred fifty people who've signed up already. So if you have a spare two hundred thousand dollars laying around, you could fly on Virgin as well. So there's opportunity here. Or if you're like a hybrid entrepreneur, which <laughs> We heard that term this Was morning. That hybrid so cool. yeah. Is there a hybrid um, entrepreneur in this room? Janine. Okay. Well, anyway, if you're a hybrid entrepreneur and you like take off two hundred thousand dollars, you could buy yourself a ticket. You could buy me a ticket. I'm just saying. It'd be awesome. You had a question. Um, did y'all hear about the? I think it was Pizza Hut or Domino's on the moon. They really have plans to actually do this. Domino's. Is it Domino's? Nice. I vote for In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions while we're here? So what do you guys think? Anybody follow some NASA social media accounts? Uh, no? OK. Sure. Uh, you can also go to nasa.gov slash connect. Um, the interesting thing, it's a list of all, all the ways that NASA connects with the public. Um, Twitter accounts, Flickr accounts, because we know right that a picture is worth a 1,000 words. And NASA has some freaking cool pictures. Um, it's very interesting. There's MySpace accounts on there. Um, so, so different places. Everybody can find a way to connect with NASA. Um, so continuing on, kind of as Nick was saying, how do we get past the whole, oh, we like social media, and get to the point where we're really engaging the public in the actual mission of exploring the unknown? Because that's the cool part. You know, when I was eight, I sat in my third grade class and watched a space shuttle explode on TV. And my immediate thought was, that's worth my life. I want to go work for NASA. Because I was watching something that in my mind was so heroic and, and made such a difference. So now I sit here, many, many years later, and I go, how can I, as a person with a degree in Greek, no engineering background, <laughs> right? None of the things you would normally associate with working for NASA, how can I contribute to the mission? And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about next. Um, the best ideas and solutions aren't all rocket scientists. Um, and the thing is, it's a process, not a product. Somebody wrote an article about our team um, last night, and they said it's a dream, not just a destination. 
And we really like that one a lot. It's about shifting what the story is about. Um, because the reality is we are a government in beta. Um, I am not a digital native, um, but most of the people that we address now are. Um, and the fact is the government has not caught up with that. Is that, is that a revelation to anyone here? Um, and so the fact that we as a government have to learn to respond differently in a world that's been changed by the information age is something that's just now catching up with both how NASA accomplishes its mission and um, what they define that mission actually as. Um, so our, our biggest challenge remains culture. Um, is there anyone else who has culture issues in your organization or in your company? Right? Culture remains our biggest challenge because people look at events like tweet ups and they come in and they're like, oh, you invite all these people in, you get let them touch the hardware, you hang out with them, they get all this access. Isn't that what life's really like at NASA? Well, I have to tell you, it's not always really like that. And so we really want to take the inside culture at NASA and transform it so all of the work that we do works as well and as cohesively as that. Um, so how we get beyond 140 characters. Although it really annoys me that they did that you can lo tweet longer thing, because it's like cheating, <laughs> you know? Um, so in our mind, this really started with, this is um, the Transparency and Open Government Directive. Um, when our president came into office, um, the first thing that he signed going into office um, was that directive and created um, the Open Government Initiative, enlisting every government agency to open its doors and its data to the American people. And so part of what our team focuses on is saying, okay, NASA spends tons of money and time and expertise on things like, how do you build the best windows in outer space? How do you create the most efficient propulsion how does the human body react in microgravity? If I had all this data on all these subjects and I gave them to companies who are trying to build better cars or make things fireproof or figure out how to support scuba divers on the bottom of the ocean, would that help them? And so the Open Government Initiative is a fab is just an amazing opportunity, both for NASA to become more relevant to the public, not just in the sense of, raw well, we think space is cool, but in the sense of the work that NASA does changes things and can make the work and the efforts and the products that we're producing here for life on Earth better every single day. So gold star to whoever knows who these three gentlemen with the president are. Buzz Aldrin. Anybody know who the other two are? Uh, Mike Collins and, um, uh-oh, the other name escapes me. Mike Collins, Buzz Aldrin. The and only other, the name, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the name everybody knows, Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong, thank you. Yes. Um, so we have to make a shift. Because opening data and opening information and opening stories is not the way we've been operating, but it is the opportunity that's before us. Um, so the focuses of the Open Government Initiative are transparency, collaboration, and participation. And we really believe that this is what cha changes not just um, NASA, but the whole US government in ways that we get really excited about advocating for. Transparency is usually people's idea about open government. They say it's, oh, well, you'll share how you spent your money or how you spent your time. But we really believe that collaboration, who we work with and how we work with them, and participation, how we give people a route into substantial participation in what we do um, is a vital role of that. Um, so the, real quickly, I'll just look at these, the five principles of open government. Um, we're in this to increase agency transparency and accountability to external stakeholders. We want people to know what NASA is actually doing. Um, we're running a new challenge. I'll get to this in a few. We're running a challenge, and we have um, an open contact us form on the website. Anybody ever have open contact forms on your websites? Do you get interesting feedback? So when you talk about transparency, people go, where are you hiding the alien spaceships? 
Well, we're not hiding any alien spaceships, I promise. But um, the fact is, the chance to start having some of these conversations is really valuable. Um, two, we're in this to enable citizen participation in NASA's vision. This is my favorite one, so I've obviously been talking about it. Um, we're in this to improve NASA's um, collaboration and innovation internally. It's not just externally. Um, there are some things we're not that good at internally yet either, but we're getting better all the time. Um, four, we're encouraging partnerships that create economic opportunity. This is such a theme in our country right now, and NASA is as committed to it as anyone else at finding ways, like I said, can our, can our data or our expertise um, stir the economy or technology development in other sectors or other industries? Can we help ca be a catalyst um, for what they want to see? And the last one is this institutionalized open government philosophies and practices at NASA. What our team regularly says is we're in this to put ourselves out of a job. Open government is not my and Nick and the rest of our team's job. Open government is what everybody at NASA needs to be doing. Um, and when everybody can show ways that they've increased transparency, collaboration, and participation in their work, then we'll have succeeded about that. That's really beautiful. Good job. Um, and so I just, we want to just This is why we hire Allie, because she's such an encourager. <laughs> Even if I can't talk, she still makes me feel good. You're great. Um, so we're going to show you some examples of projects that we're involved in um, that have enabled participation. Because whatever, wherever you're coming from, whatever experience you have, you want people to participate in what your client or what your company is doing. So we'll throw up some of these examples. Um, we did a great partnership with Gowalla. Who knows about Gowalla? Um, it's real interesting. Um, it's Foursquare-like, but in some ways very different. Um, and this was really neat because it kind of sent people on a treasure hunt. Um, and so it really encouraged people to go to a variety of places, um, find out the information that was to be had there, and to compete to get an Explorer badge. Um, Top Coder um, is a competitive software development community. Doesn't that sound very official? Um, what Top Coder is, is we provide our software challenges to communities of developers and offer them opportunities to address them for prizes. And so we say we need someone who can build this or create this algorithm or solve this software problem and put it out there um, in a competitive way. It's been incredibly successful as an open innovation platform um, for the programming community. Um, Innocentive is one of our other open innovation efforts. Um, if you go to the, you go to innocentive.com, NASA has an innovation pavilion where we publish specific challenges to say, NASA's trying to figure out how to do this better. Um, one example was we were looking at ways we could preserve food for a long time on orbit with less waste. Right? Because on Earth, it's one thing to preserve food, but often we do that with more plastic. And that becomes a problem on the space station. And so one of the problems that they put up there was um, how can we keep it, keep it fresh longer without adding to trash? And there are people in different backgrounds who have a lot of experience in that and who can do that for cash prizes. Um, this is very near and dear to our heart. This is rock.org, which is random hacks of kindness. We should have brought some rock stickers. I'm sad we forgot that. Um, Random Hacks of Kindness is a partnership between NASA, the World Bank, Yahoo, Google, HP, and I'm missing one. Who am I missing? Microsoft. Microsoft. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, and what we do is, is it's a community engaged in hacking for humanity. So we run hackathons twice a year um, that invite those communities to come in and go, how can, you, how can we offer data and developers to create solutions for the developing world? And it's been a really fun adventure. The next one's going to be December 4th and 5th. Um, the closest one to here is in Austin. And so go to rock.org if you're interested in more information. Um, I know the last session that I just sat in talked about social responsibility for companies. Um, and Rock is a great example of how companies like Yahoo and Google and Microsoft are focusing their particular skill set in, in the realm of social responsibility and how you can use it um, to, to create 
not just token good, like, oh, we gave some money or this or that, but, but create real and lasting good that's unique um, to their company and their background. Um, Water Hackathon is coming up October 21st and 22nd, and this is um, another type of rock event um, focused on water problems. And so it's a great example of NASA goes, how can we provide safe, clean water sources on the moon, a place with limited resources, um, a, a very difficult environment? It's not that different than people in Rwanda going, how can we provide water safely in a place with limited resources and a difficult environment and no infrastructure. So we start going, how can we share these stories in a way that becomes really compelling? Science Hack Day is super fun. It's kind of how do we go build things and play with toys. Um, the next one is going to be in San Francisco in November. Um, yay, San Francisco, we love it. Um, so it's wonderful because it's also great collaboration networking opportunities. Let's go and see how things work and encourage that. Um, this is Maker Camp, and Maker Camp has been a fun NASA project. Um, it's become an effort. I, I totally recommend this if you have a company that has a lot of managerial hierarchy. Anybody like that? Um, because what happened is we had really high up NASA managers, um, really new employees and interns, and everybody in the middle who came into a room for one day and said if we had one day to work on short term projects totally outside the scope of what we normally do, what would you do that would make NASA better? And so we came up with 12 projects that the groups addressed at Maker Camp and just said, short period of time, diverse people, build a community, and make something awesome, see what happens. As she mentioned, Maker Camp is really great because often we hear about like Google 20% time and how we wish every company would allow for Google 20% time and to allow you to pursue side projects. I think I was looking at the tweet, Twitter stream and there was some talk about it earlier today. At NASA, we've had a hard time convincing our management that we should be able to do that. Okay. So what we've done instead is just said, okay, well, we're going to have these maker camp events, and we do them about every quarter, two days, or f for a day or two during the work week. And then everyone's like, oh, okay, we, we're, we're okay with that. It's essentially the same thing, um, but we just called it something different and then focused it on a, on a two-day period of time. So it's a way for us to slowly bring along our culture um, in, a, in kind of a bureaucracy. So. And those are great examples because I love what he just said. We have to slowly bring along our culture. It doesn't happen all at once. So if you can give little tastes of it, um, acceptance increases. And I want to run through these so we can have more time for questions. Uh, Zooniverse.org. Anybody been on Zooniverse? Um, you really need to check this out. So Zooniverse has various citizen science projects. So for example, um, one is called Planet Hunters. And they just publicized on CNN that two just regular people, not astronomers or anything, by their interaction in Zooniverse, discovered two brand new planets, never before known. Um, we're about to do an underwater version where you can go underwater and interact with, look at pictures. What you're doing is you're looking at pictures and just saying what you see most of the time. And it's because NASA downloads four terabytes of Earth science data a day. Just think about the amount of that. And that's just our science data. That's not everything. That's just one, one small piece. Do you think that we have enough people or time or resources to comb through all that data? So Zooniverse is a great example of an effort to crowdsource um, citizen science and make it accessible to people and say, if we had people's eyes on this stuff, what we could see. And, and Planet Hunters was a great example of they found planets. I mean, how cool is that? You know, what'd you do today? I found a planet. Moon Zoo is on there. There's all, all different ones. Um, I'm going to run through these because I think we're running short on time. These are some of NASA's analog projects, and these are really cool because um, we do amazing missions on Earth, and people don't, seem, don't always realize that. Desert Rats is an example. They take the, the lunar rover out um, in New Mexico. Isn't it in New Mexico? Um, and they experiment with doing it out in a, a hot, dry environment, see what it's like out there, see um, running analog missions. Um, the Houghton Mars Project is another one. Doesn't that look kind of like Mars? It's really a volcanic, um, a dried up volcano in Canada. 
and they camp out and they kind of experiment what life is really like in some of these places. Pavilion Lake is another example um, of another analog project. There are algae growths down under the water and they look at kind of living in these extreme environments. What we learn, and it's applicable to space exploration, but like we said, it's applicable to so many other things too. FragileOasis.org is one of my favorite sites. Um, astronaut Ron Guerin um, talks about his experience on orbit and um, what he could see about the Earth and how, um, how difficult that was for him to, to feel like we didn't value the Earth like we could. And so he began um, a platform that encouraged community action projects that made the Earth better, that were environmentally sensitive and um, that supported citizens' individual efforts to improve our fragile oasis. Um, this is our website, so if you want to check us out or come visit our collaborative space at the Johnson Space Center, go here to open.nasa.gov. Um, this is our ongoing blog where we talk about open, open government projects, um, what we're involved in, um, what exciting things we see happening across the agency. We've done a lot of efforts in open source um, and open data have been our two main focuses lately. Um, and you can keep up with us or contact us this way. Um, data.nasa.gov is our, our other new project. Um, and that's our open data platform. You want to know what we got sent back from the Voyager probes? You can go on data.nasa.gov and download all the data we got from Voyager or from Mars Phoenix or from other missions. Um, we don't have all of NASA's data yet, but we're building it a little at a time. And it's really exciting um, to make it available to people and see what cool things they can do with it. Um, this is the open government plan, nasa.gov slash open. And we'll take the last few minutes for questions. Come on, guys. What you have to say is just as important as what we have to say, probably. Or, or we could ask them questions. To oh, I like that even better. <laughs> Seriously, though, anybody have questions, thoughts? Anybody go, yeah, some of that might work for me? Or somebody you want to go, no, that would never work for me? Yeah. It's OK. <laughs> we do. It's awesome, actually. So um, our team is distributed. Anybody else work in a distributed environment? No, interesting. So three of us are here in Texas. One of us is in Washington, DC, and one is in California. So um, right now, we're trying to do it once a quarter. Is that true? Well, once a quarter, we try to all be in the same city and spend a week working together. We just did the most recent one in Texas, although I always advocate for California, because who wants to go to Houston when you can go to San Francisco? Um, right? Seriously. Um, so it's a wonderful experience, because when you're used to doing a lot of your work virtually, we work on Adobe Connect, we work on Skype, we use GitHub, you know, we do a lot of our work um, online. But all of a sudden, that time together in person becomes really precious. And so we spend some of it just hanging out and connecting and living life so we know each other better. We spend a lot of it brainstorming. You know, you think you'll come together and have meetings or things. But really, it's our best, some of our best idea generation time is when we sit in the room together. We're up late. You know, what we did our last co-working week is um, we have a Google Liquid Galaxy, which is an eight-screen hypercave. And we installed the space shuttle simulator on it and stayed up and played with it. <laughs> um, he's going to try to put a video up there. But co-working is a great example. We have a co-working space um, at the Space Center, which is a collaborative space. People react a lot to it because they think, well, at NASA, we reserve our conference rooms and make things work. We go, no, no, no. This is a collaborative space. Everybody works together. What do you mean together? <laughs> And so we invite people to come into it. So if you want to come co-work with us one day, like you said, just send us a Twitter or go on our website and send us a note. We'd love to have you come up because all of a sudden when you have a developer and a designer and a rocket scientist sitting in the room together, their work starts to rub off on each other and they get these conversations going and they get excited. Like it all matters and it all feeds each other. It's a really beautiful thing. Any other questions? Did you? Oh, this is awesome. We'll, we'll close with this because you'll, you'll see how cool it is. 
So this is our friend Stuart, and this is his video that he did um, of our Liquid Galaxy project. Um, this is an open source project that Google released using Google Earth. Um, but guess where Google Earth got the data? From NASA. So we're like, well, why don't we build something cool that we can do with that? And so this is an example of what they can do. It's a really big video, and the web is slow. But it's, yeah, it's on the website. You can pull it so up. So what's really fun about this video is that Stuart and I presented this to like super high senior management at NASA last week, and we were behind like 20 other presentations, which were the worst presentations ever. Small PowerPoint font is really bad. So Stuart made this video that kind of shows him flying the Liquid Galaxy, which the slow inter internet does not do this justice. But the Battlestar Galactica soundtrack, if you, if you put your speakers on. So <laughs> totally we, like, right. we like dim the, there's all these like engineers and we like dim the lights and just put this up behind us. And the music, it was, it was great. So I think, I think they really understood what we were trying to do. It's totally cool. Yeah, let me just say, so we have a collaborative working space at Johnson. Uh, if you guys ever want to just co-work with us, we love doing that. We love opening up our space for anybody. We have some cool toys to play with. So if you guys are interested, again, look up Allie or myself on Twitter. Shoot us a message. We'll get you a guest badge, and then we can collaborate on something together. And we love to talk about yeah, this I'll stuff. Yeah, put our Twitter But we Twitter. also want um, you guys to come talk to us about what you do. Like, because we like the the bi-directionality thing. So we love to, we got invited to somebody's happy hour and different project. Like, we love that. So we want to come work with you one day. We go to Rice and work a lot because we just think that when you relocate a lot, and this is part of the ethos of co-working, when we relocate a lot, it, it feeds new ideas and new things you see and new people you talk to. Um, it changes everything. So keep us posted and let us know. Uh, but thanks for listening to us. Um, we really appreciate you guys. It's an honor to be here. Um, we appreciate your vision for exploration because it's what fuels our vision for exploration um, so that we can all go out and discover the unknown.